so uh, Dave Keller isn't here this morning. I know he's in Kentucky, and he's asked me for a while when I'm going to use a golf illustration. This is sort of a golf illustration. So a few years ago, uh, some friends gave a friend gave me a set of golf clubs. He actually got some new ones, and I just asked him, "Can I have his old ones?" He said, "Yeah, sure." Um, and so, if you know that, that's become one of my hobbies. And but I'm not going to tell you about um, me necessarily. So if um, a little while after that, I was at the Lemoyne Antique Mall. Hopefully all of you frequent that place. You can find some real treasures. And I found a real treasure. And it was a, driving, a driver about this big, perfect for little kids, and it only cost three bucks. And so I took James and Lily um, to the driving range over in Dauphin Highlands. And we got a Gatorade, and we got a big bucket of balls, and we're trying to make sense of how in the world you hit a stationary little ball in the right direction. And, um, and Lily and I are kind of talking off the side, drinking our Gatorade, and all of a sudden we hear James yell, I hate this game! <laughs> and I just love that because if you've ever tried to just hit that little ball, you've actually had that exact same experience. I hate this little thing. Uh, why bother? And... Um, you know, most of us really want to just do things that come sort of naturally to us, right? We kind of want to do things that like we can just grab onto fairly easily. And one of the things that's horrible about golf is that even Tiger Woods, who's the best ever, shot a 10 on one hole when he won the Masters the last time. Okay, um, in his really brilliant book that I really hope all of you have read, um, C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity, he, he says that, that we often take ourselves as sort of the starting point, um, our own desires and our own interests and our own abilities, but as the starting point from which we kind of engage with the world. Um, and, and here's what we do. We, we admit that there's something else in the world, and he says call it morality or call it decent behavior or the good of society, and this other has a claim on ourselves, right? It, it invites us to something outside of ourselves. And he says sometimes that, that other actually is in conflict with sort of our natu naturally who we are, our desires and our interests and our abilities. And so those desires and interests and abilities, we could say they're wrong and they actually need to conform to something that is outside of ourselves, that good uh, for our neighbor, decent behavior, morality. And he says, of course, sometimes it actually comports with those things. And, and that's kind of, that's a good thing, and we can be at rest in a little ways with those things. But he says this. He says, we're always hoping that when all of these demands are fully met, there'll still be a chance to get on with our lives. Like when we're trying to actually do these moral things, these decent behaviors, and he says we're actually like the, the man who's trying to pay his taxes, and eventually he pays his taxes, and he hopes he has just at least a little bit left to live on. Um, he says we when we're pursuing this morality and this decent behavior, this good of society, we take ourselves as a starting point and that actually leads to a very destructive place. He says that two results likely follow. We, get, we either give up trying to be good. <laughs> there's just too much. There's too much demanding, demanded of us. There's too much need in the world. There's too much for the good of society. Or we become very unhappy. He says if you really do try to demand, uh, meet the demands put on you, you will not have enough to live on. Your natural self, as it seeks to obey every single demand put upon itself, will be starved and hampered and worry at every turn. And this is what he says, you will get angrier and angrier. And I actually sort of wonder if this is sort of what's just happening in our world, generally speaking. We have these com competing ideas of what is the good of our neighbor. And we're just trying to say, you know what, we can kind of do this. And we're actually overwhelmed and we're just getting angrier and angrier and angrier with everybody and everything. He says this, this is a quote. In the end, you will either give up trying to be good or else become one of those people who, as they say, live for others, but always in a discontented, grumbling way. Always wondering why the other did not notice it more or always making a martyr of yourselves. He has that when, once you become like this, put this over here. You will be difficult for everyone and anyone. And everyone wish, will wish that you had just kept trying to be selfish because that will actually be more pleasant than trying to get everything done all the time. Here's sort of where I'm going with this. Okay. 
James yelling, I hate this game, um, could produce a couple things. Um, he really could just throw that $3 driver up in the air and never pick it up again and just be mad at this like life. Um, he could decide, you know, I'm going to get this done. And you know the phrase, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, right? And just kind of angry at the world anyway. I'm going to master this. Um, I'm going to do it. And if I can't do it, I'm just going to throw it all away. Those are the options. Um, this, this might seem like a strange way to start this, but here's the, this psalm. This psalm is, um, is first describing God as very distant. God's really far off in this psalm. First, this is how it begins, right? Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. He's getting to this place where it seems like God is so far away from him. He's far away from God. And I think that for most of us, at least you all here are sitting in church chairs. They're not pews. We're downstairs for the summer. But, you know, like, you're the people that are in the pews. And I think that for the temptation for us to think of, hey, someone being distant from God is primarily thinking all of those people that are outside. They're the ones that are distant from God. Distance from God makes us think of those who are outside, maybe those who ridicule God, maybe your neighbor who just doesn't want to talk to you about Jesus at all. Don't bring up Jesus with that neighbor. Or maybe the person who like grew up in the church and they gave up long ago. Or maybe they've recently said, uh, I don't want God. They've kind of you know, deconstructed their faith. Um, so those are the people that I think we first think of they're distant, right? The person who's really out there. At best, they maybe are the, the Creaster Christians. You know those ones? They come on Christ, Christmas and Easter. You guys know the term? Creasters? You know, this might be destri- describing Creasters at best. But for the most part, what we think is this, these are the this little description of God being distant from you is for the people out there. Um, some of us, um, some of us are prone to thinking that way. I would guess most of us are prone to thinking that way. The people who are distant from God are out there. And let me say this, okay, actually, because I know some people watch this online, and I know my guess is that some of you maybe are here and you're like, actually, I do feel like my faith is so, so distant. If you actually are describing it, described in that way, if you've sort of been deconstructing your faith, or if you're just like so distant from God, and you know that, you know that's you, consider this text, okay? And consider that what the Lord says in this text is that you need Jesus, okay? That is part of it. But what struck me when I was studying this psalm is that the distance that is being described in the beginning here is immediately followed by the phrase that is so lovely in this psalm, which is this, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Which is to say, this person has some semblance of the idea that that they actually are part of the community of faith. And we're actually told in in the title that this is of David. So this is written by the community of faith and for the community of faith. This is written in the Psalms, the songbook of God's people. And David is saying, and God's people are saying, Lord, I'm distant. God, I'm distant. Lead me to the one that is stronger than myself, that's safer than myself. I need to be on the rock that's beyond me. I need to have a refuge that's outside of myself and my own ability. My inclination to think that I can be the strong tower. Here's part of what C.S. Lewis is getting at. Most of us are going to hate life. Uh, We're going to hate sports. We're going to hate pursuing the good of our society, the good of our neighbor or morality, all the rest of it. If we take ourselves as the starting point, if we primarily say, oh, I can't do this, and therefore it stinks or I stink or... You're just going to hate life if you primarily think of it as starting with you. 
We either become miserable with how poorly we're doing at life, or we become utterly insufferable, you know? Because we're mostly looking down at other people thinking they're doing it so poorly. Why don't they just look at me? Here's what I'm suggesting to you is that as as long as as long as our view is looking down on others, we're going to be insufferable. As long as our view is just a horizontal view, uh, we're going to think this is awful. We're going to hate it because we're going to just see ourselves and others. And one of the things that this text is calling us to, even in the distance from God, is to see that the best thing for you to do is look above yourself to the one who is over all things, over your situation, over your particular abilities, or the mess of this life, the best thing you can do is look outside and above yourself. 